So, I'm Jim Mann, I'm in the political science department, but I'm also the local Democratic <coughs> Party chair. It might be the latter, is why uh, we're having this event today, but who knows. But, but anyway, the, the, uh, the reason we're here is because Congressman Neal and I have been talking, a little, you know, for some time, we bump into each other in New Hampshire or someplace about doing another event at Williams, because he did one many years ago. And uh, he loves to teach. Uh, he's uh, a guest lecturer, for, he's been for a long time at UMass Amherst. And uh, I like tax policy and I have several colleagues who do. And we have lots of people who are really interested in politics. And he's been in politics a really long time. So let's, let's just think about how long it is. First of all, he's the dean of the Massachusetts delegation, but also the dean of the entire New England delegation. When you're the dean, that means you've been there the longest. Um, <laughs> or maybe the smartest, I'm not sure. Did they just, yeah, okay. Um, there's that. He was mayor of, of the city of Springfield between 1984 and 88, uh, during a time when Springfield, really early on uh, in the 80s, Springfield wasn't looking too good and it was looking a lot better in 1988. And he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1988 and has served since in a district that didn't used to include Berkshire County, but uh, since uh, the last redistricting does. Um, He's an expert on taxes. Obviously, he's been on the Ways and Means Committee for a really long time, and he has now risen to the, to the post of ranking member, which means he's the senior Democrat and gets to watch the Republicans try to do what they try to do, uh, whatever kept, it's in Kevin Brady's head in a particular moment. Um, and so that means that he's really in an important position, not just, in this, in this case, to uh, see policy being done, but also to be thinking through the alternatives should we flip the House and should the Democrats become the majority and he become chair of Ways and Means. So I'll, I, before I let him speak, I just want to let you know we're going to have, we have two other people coming. We have Ways and Means Committee staff coming along later. They've been delayed. They're about five or ten minutes out. Their <laughs> names are Brandon Casey. Brandon Casey is the Democratic Chief of Staff for the committee. Um, and Kara Getz, she's going to be seated over here. Uh, she's chief counsel for the committee. They are both tax experts. And so I hope you are all prepared with your really wonky questions. Um, but not just for them, because obviously Congressman Neal's been toiling in this vineyard for a really long time, and he will be able to answer them too. So, so thank you very much for coming again, Congressman, and welcome. Thanks, Jim, very, very much. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, this is really a, a pleasure for me uh, to come to Williams College. This is, of course, one of the premier addresses for higher education in the world. And uh, Mr. President, thanks very much for stopping over. I, I got the nicest personal note this week proving that, once again, uh, you don't last as long as I have without paying attention to uh, email and uh, long-form letters and all kinds of journals and, and experts. And uh, so I, I thought that was a very warm greeting based on the position I had taken on DACA. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President. And to Jim, uh, I, I think it's he's in hand not only in the classroom but in the political vineyards. Uh, he indicated that I have uh, held the title of lecturer at the University of Massachusetts for a long time and, and enjoyed it immensely and spent 10 years as a trustee uh, at Mount Holyoke College. So I've had a great personal and professional regard for what it is that takes place every single day in the classrooms of uh, not just Western Massachusetts but indeed across the country. So what I thought I would do is uh, as we await to well, my tax staffers, just give you a little bit of the lore of the Ways and Means Committee because it's worth it. And the Ways and Means Committee has broad jurisdiction for revenue. And recall that our Constitution says that every revenue measure must begin in the House of Representatives. And in the House of Representatives, every revenue measure begins in the Ways and Means Committee. It is a very small working committee, 40 members, 24 Republicans and 16 Democrats. And it is based upon the proportion of members of the House of Representatives between the two political parties. So as you might expect, in the minority, our goal is to reverse the proportion in 2018 so that we might then have broader influence on possible revenue outcomes. But the committee beyond taxation, which we're going to talk a lot about uh, this afternoon, the committee also has broad responsibility for trade and tariffs, welfare, pensions, 
Social Security, Medicare, and the tax aspect of Medicaid. So in the development and passage of the Affordable Care Act, of which I was a player, the Medicaid tax side of it, which became very controversial, originated in the House of Representatives. Now in the history of, of the Ways and Means Committee, which is the longest standing committee in the House of Representatives, in its history, it has uh, also had broad responsibilities within the institution. And up until just about 30 years ago, uh, the Ways and Means Committee had broad influence on other committee assignments. So you would probably have come to the conclusion that people knew Wilbur Mills, for those of us who have some gray in our hair. And Wilbur Mills was a very conservative House member from Arkansas. And he was so conservative that he gave us Medicare and Medicaid. <laughs> because he saw that as a new dealer in the aftermath of what success we had had with Social Security and its guarantee. And remember, one of the best things about Social Security, I've become the primary defender in the House, one of the best things about Social Security is the following. You can outlive an annuity. You cannot outlive Social Security. And that's the bedrock guarantee of Social Security. So Wilbur Mills decided, with a president that was like-minded, Lyndon Johnson in 1965, to amend the Social Security Act. And where did they sign that legislation? In Harry Truman's living room. So Lyndon Johnson, Wilbur Mills, Hubert Humphrey went to Harry Truman's home because Harry Truman had been the first president to promote the idea of universal health care coverage. And they decided then, as is the case now, that Medicare was the closest that we'd ever come to providing universal health care. Great thing about it is you turn 65, you're in. No test of gender, race, income, you're in. And one of the decisions we frequently have to make in the Ways and Means Committee is, and I'll give you just a, I think it's a pretty good insight. You will often hear people say, let the wealthy out of Medicare and Social Security. Why should they get a benefit from Medicare and Social Security? Well, the reason they should is because if you let them out of it, it will lose its constituency and it'll become a poverty program. And poverty programs, agree or disagree, they don't have quite the same standing that what is known as the earned benefit might have. And people look at Social Security and Medicare and they say, that's an earned benefit. Despite the fact on the Social Security side, you get back a lot more than you ever paid in. And on the Medicare front, uh, I, I've recently proposed expanding uh, Medicare for dental, hearing, and eyesight. And I think improving Medicare is where we, we need to be headed. But just a, another part of it, that, that I think is important in terms of the, the history of the committee. There used to be the sense that no nuts could be on the Ways and Means Committee. <laughs> because when you're dealing with funding the federal government's budget, and when you're dealing with these very sensitive issues, that you wanted what we would call mainstream thinking. And so I went to the committee when Dan Rostenkowski was the chairman. That gives you a timeline. And if you recall, the last time that the tax system in America was addressed fundamentally was during his tenure in 1986. So I am in the midst of completing my 25th year as a member of the committee. And uh, it's an interesting committee because uh, I'm still not the senior Democrat in terms of longevity on it. But I'm now the leader of the Democratic caucus. And the aspiration, obviously, is to become the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And I always like to point out that uh, when you go into room 208, 208 off the Capitol, which is this magnificent room, there are eight American presidents who served on the Ways and Means Committee. Pretty, pretty good alums when you consider the decisions that, that uh, we've made over many, many years. Now, part of our history, which includes, by the way, the service of James Madison on that committee, but part of our history is also not just policy, which, as you all would know, is exceedingly difficult. There are four million words in the American tax code. United Technologies, just south of Springfield in Hartford, their tax forms are 19,000 pages with 11 IRS agents on site full time. 
So that means when the CEO of that company gets on the elevator to go to the, his designation, it would not be unusual for him to meet an IRS agent in the elevator. And the IRS, as much as it is a bedeviled institution in America right now, it's also responsible for the following. We have the highest voluntary compliance tax rate and ratio in the world. In the world. About 87% of the American people pay their taxes on time. And part of it is obviously the threat of the IRS, and we were just exchanging with a professor that was here, we are having a, a bit of a, a, a laughter moment when it was suggested, remember the IRS is the only agency in the galaxy of the federal government where you have to prove your innocence. Unlike a courtroom where the government has to prove you're guilty, with the IRS you have to demonstrate your innocence. And we oversee the IRS, and they really do a remarkable job, despite the fact that many people, perhaps even here, have tangled with the IRS in the past. And it does take a long period of time, frequently, to bring these cases to conclusion. So this year, as we speak, we have begun the discussion again about what to do with America's tax code. And I drew the quote in the New York Times a couple of days ago. I'm doing, I will let you in on this because it's an academic setting, so there is an opportunity to, to talk candidly. But what we're doing right now is we are doing off-the-record conversations with major news outlets in America. So two weeks ago, it was the New York Times, the reporter who covers tax. Yesterday, it was CNN. I did an event with Politico yesterday, and I will be doing the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Richard Rubin, who you read frequently, he's already been in. And I do the off-the-record conversation with them to try to set the table on what Democrats are thinking of as we go to taxes. So the last time the tax code was fundamentally altered was in 1986. That's before the internet was invented. And there is, across America and across Congress, a broad agreement on what's wrong with the tax code. There's far less agreement on how to repair it. Because the conversation frequently starts with higher taxes and lower taxes. Where I've tried to make the argument in this atmosphere, what about a tax system that improves the quality of life for all members of the American family? The disruption that has occurred in this debate is based upon the fact that it used to be done in a bipartisan manner. So people will frequently say it was Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill, Dan Rostenkowski, Bob Packwood, Dick Gephardt, and Bill Bradley. I would submit another name that was terribly important in 1986, and that was Jim Baker, because he had the full faith and trust of President Reagan and Vice President Bush and as an emissary going to Capitol Hill, they knew when they were talking to the president's representative what he said would hold when he went back to tell the president what they'd agreed to. And with Dan Rostenkowski, I think it would be fair to state that he was not home at night studying Tolstoy's War and Peace. <laughs> but coming from Chicago, he had a superb idea of what the art form of the final deal might look like. And as we hearken back to 86 and say, wow, what an achievement, there were a lot of fine people that got hurt in the 1986 Tax Act. Because there were fundamental changes made across the code. And I attempted, uh, I was at the White House with the President back in uh, March, I think, and the advertised purpose of the meeting was to talk about reopening NAFTA and to talk about taxes. And we spent a lot of time, myself, Ron Wyden, Kevin Brady, and Orrin Hatch were auditioning with the president. And of course, the president spent 15 seconds on taxes and announced that China was the worst trade deal in the history of the world until somebody mentioned NAFTA, and that became the worst trade deal in the history of the world. And by the time we left Panama, it was the worst trade deal in the history of the world. <laughs> but I knew if he stuck to the tax issue, which he didn't, I was going to question him on passive loss, because our tax code if there's one portion of the tax code that is very especially favored, it's the real estate market. It draws, draw, it draws enormous benefits. And nowhere is that more pronounced than in midtown Manhattan. <laughs> so three items as we go forward. 
the mortgage interest deduction, charitable giving, and employer-based health insurance. Now, those are huge tax expenditures. And what I mean by an expenditure is the following. It means but for those exclusions, preferences, or deductions in the code, that is money that would flow to the federal treasury. Now, I would bet that if I were to ask the president of Williams College if he's in favor of shaving back the charitable giving, that, I thought that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but broad agreement on what's wrong with the code. <laughs> less, agree less agreement on that. And I would guess that uh, there's not a lot of sympathy in the audience for getting rid of the mortgage interest deduction. And if you're talking to Barack Obama, I bet he's not in favor of getting rid of the preference for employer-based health insurance because 158 million Americans derive that benefit. That's where the money goes. Now, you can get to the bow and arrow exclusion, heavily favored by congressmen and women from Louisiana, less favored by urban congressmen from New England. And this is where this battle is going to ensue. So, a couple of other important items. When you look at how deductions are itemized, only about one-third of the American people itemize their tax forms. And it's even more limited to the coastal regions of the country. So we're going to see on September 25th, allegedly, we're going to see a Republican proposal. Now, it, that's the policy side of things. Now, on the political side of things, the Democratic position is going to be to encourage President Trump to stick with, stick with his position on middle class tax relief. He campaigned on that theme, has said repeatedly no tax cuts for people at the top, and in breakfast with Ron Wyden in a meeting with Orrin Hatch this week, we went back and forth. And at this stage, it's pretty nice, pretty pleasant because we're dealing in generalities. And what's important about this discussion is the following. Democrats are going to insist on what is known as revenue neutrality. And in revenue neutrality, what we mean by that is we are going to use the same number of dollars and move them around within the system, not to add to the federal deficits. Where the battle line is to be drawn between the two parties is going to be over the distribution tables. And the distribution tables are about who gets what, when, where, and how. So part of the argument is going to be sophisticated. Do you double the size of the standard deduction? Or as Ron Wyden and I discussed this week, maybe as an alternative, tripling the size of the standard deduction, and then taking away many of the exclusions and preferences in the code. Now, we also have another position that's much celebrated, and I, I know that the tax experts here will understand this perhaps better than the, the general public, uh, another very important consideration for us is to get rid of the carried interest deduction. You can't find business people who support it. It is very limited now to private equity in America. So these discussions get pretty intense, but they're also pretty complicated. So before I introduce my two tax staffers, who are really superb, uh, to talk about some of these items in, in even greater detail, the quote that I was offered in the New York Times by way of background when I was interviewed by the New York Times reporter, I think his name is Rappaport, and it, it goes very nice. He can't, for the students that are here, he can't use something that I don't want used for attribution. So that's part of the negotiation. But I will talk to him on background and then he will say to me, can I use this? So the one quote he used was one that I said you can use. So when Gary Cohn came in, president's top economic advisor, and he is, like the president, a New Yorker. Shoulders back, you know, comes from a big Wall Street firm and has been very, very successful. And he said to me, the wealthy are going to be really upset with what we're about to do. And then he said, and Congressman, I want you to know something. We are going to tear the tax code up by its roots. We're going to rip the tax code apart. We are going to revolutionize the tax code. 
And I said to him, now I want to tell you something. Six secretaries of the Treasury have sat in that chair and told me the same thing. <laughs> until the charitable giving issue is up front, until the mortgage interest deduction is up front. And this is where the controversy settles in. It's like trying to squeeze toothpaste with the cap on. So what I'd like to do at this time to talk about what staffers do are two really skilled tax professionals. Uh, Brandon Casey has worked for me for a long time. He started in my office, and when I became the head of the Democratic Caucus, I appointed him the chief of staff and tax director at the Ways and Means Committee on the Democratic side. And Kara Getz has worked for me twice. She went back to work for the Finance Committee. She's an expert on pensions as well. I mean, she really knows this stuff. And right now we're working on, I hope it will be an answer to the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest Teamsters Union difficulties with their pension plans, the multi-employer plans. So we actually have a proposal that we hatched with the pension experts in the Democratic Leader's Office this week. And uh, Brandon Casey, one of the, he's from Chicago. One of the things I like about him, he's good on policy, but he's also good on politics. And I depend on the two of them every single day, and it would not be unusual for me to talk to them 20 different times during the day. And I have uh, an open door policy, so I don't, they don't have to have an appointment to come in. They just walk in, and we talk. And they'll say, you know, Mr. Neal this or Mr. Neal that. Now, another inside baseball thing I know you're going to like, it's how is staff allocated? So I have now uh, 29 staffers that work for me. They do Medicare, Social Security, pensions, welfare, tariffs, trade, all of those issues. And what's interesting about it is Ways and Means Republicans, because they're in the majority, they take two-thirds of the staff. So they have 60 members that advise them. And we have about 30 or 31 that advise us. And unfortunately, that's another example of what's happened in Congress, where you used to be able to find agreement. And one of the last selling points I'll talk to you, because Rostenkowski uh, was the master dealer in terms of the final product. But he used to have a great line, because members of Congress would dither all of the time. After Rostenkowski had a rule, and the rule went like this. If your item was included in the bill, you had to vote for the bill, or your item came out of the bill. Now, you might say, well, that's not exactly town manager or good government work. It's the way you get recalcitrant members of Congress to vote for something. <laughs> and Rostenkowski would say to you, after you had dithered and procrastinated and pushed off the big decision, much as we all do in our lives, Rostenkowski would finally say, I told you, I was with you until the end. <laughs> it's the end. <laughs> and then you would vote yes or no. So Kara Getz uh, does pensions and Brandon Casey and they're both very, very good. Maybe they can talk to you about some of the background that's occurring, and then we're going to take your questions. And there are some here that do this uh, and with great skill as well in the classroom, and it would be a good chance to talk to people who help to formulate policy. So, Brandon, you want to go first, and then Carol? Sure. This is on. Can everyone hear me? So a lot of what we do is sort of behind the scenes. You know, the congressman sort of takes the spotlight, thankfully, because you know, <laughs> staffers are normally in the back. Uh, hiding, but a, a lot of uh, a lot of what we do is sort of lay the groundwork so that he can look good on in front of you, and sort of there's a lot of negotiations that happen behind the scenes, sort of setting the the, the infrastructure for a deal to come about. So on on tax reform, uh, I would say you know there's probably hundreds of meetings, hundreds of you know staff man hours a week that sort of are devoted to just making sure we get this right, listening from stakeholders, listening from constituents, uh, affected parties who care about the charitable tax deduction, um, and other sort of those deductions and preference exclusions the congressman sort of talked about before. So it's a, it's a, it's a tedious amount of work, um, but we sort of see the end goal being a final finished product. And you wouldn't believe uh, sort of the, the effort that goes in from you know, the lobbying community, but also sort of stakeholder meetings to sort of hear just right, because I mean, you saw the sort of the, the enormous debate around healthcare, and healthcare is such a personal thing, uh, but it's only one sixth of the economy at the end of the day. Tax reform or taxes is all of the economy. And so, you know, folks who sort of paid somewhat attention to the ACA debate are going to be keenly focused on um, the tax debate because everyone knows April 15th and everyone knows, uh, you know, 
Am I going to be, you know, so it's a simple question. Do I pay more or less in taxes, or am I about the same? And if you're more, you're going to be upset, and if you're less, you're going to be not going to talk because you're like, <laughs> make sure I got my deal. Um, so I would say sort of that's the day-to-day -day aspect of what, what we do on the Ways and Means Committee. And, you know, the Congressman, the Ways and Means Committee is sort of uh, the, a leviathan, right? We have our hands in a lot of pies. I mean, trade debate, sort of trade, health care. The, the president campaigned on trade, health care, and taxes. And those three areas, Ways and Means has primary jurisdiction over. So while the, everyone's focused on uh, taxes at the moment, health care could happen at any point in time. Um, you know, we could have a, a bad election or a bad result in New Jersey, or something happens in Arizona, and Republicans will be right back, right back to trying to repeal and replace Obamacare. And then all this time, we still sort of have NAFTA negotiations, which are, which are happening, as well as uh, maybe Korea ne negotiations. And obviously, the president sort of ended TPP, but there's always sort of ancillary talk around trade as well. So the committee is always busy. Um, I liken it to an aircraft carrier where we're always sort of tinkering at something. Something can always sort of be fixed, um, but we're always headed in the right direction. Could you talk, Brandon, about your interaction with the chief of staff on the Republican side? Because, for example, uh, Brandon texted me over the weekend and said, Chairman Brady wants to talk to you. So the staffers would go back and forth so that he would get a hold of him. Could you talk about how you interact with them? Yeah, so uh, my counterpart's Dave Stewart, a uh, good guy, um, but it's sort of the same way in which members of Congress have to sort of have this delicate dance on how, to, how the deal is cut. Um, there's always sort of offers and counter offers sort of paired it back and forth, almost like a tennis match. And then at some point we sort of say, okay, it's, it's time. And then we sort of present, present the final offers to Mr. Neal or uh, Chairman Brady. And it's up for them to sort of de debate whether or not this is good enough for them. We hope that we get it right, you know, sort of the, the, right, the right spot, um, sort of knowing, and it comes from knowing both uh, you know, Mr. Neal is also sort of uh, my counterpart, knowing uh, Chairman Brady, to sort of you know be their um, proxies for the debate, uh, and so we we think we know each other fairly well, but also sort of knowing where the Republicans want to go in this respect is also sort of helpful in knowing where they want to go. So we sort of know our different tolerances, and we sort of chat from there. Carol. Hi, my name is Kara Getz, um, and as Mr. Neal noted, I am. <clears throat> well, I don't think that happens too much on the Hill, but Mr. Neal has two instances of this where I worked for Mr. Neal a number of years ago. Actually, Brandon replaced me, and then um, when he was named to this new role of leadership of the Ways and Means Committee, I came back. And we also have another colleague, Peg McGlinch, uh, who did the same thing. So, just demonstrates how what a great boss Mr. Neal is. And so, it's a pleasure to be here and to be working for uh, Mr. Neal again. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of um, continue on to, uh, as to what Brandon was talking about in terms of the staff role. Um, taxes is very unique in the sense that I don't need to tell all of you this. It's extremely complicated. So not only do all of the uh, members of Congress have tax councils or tax legislative aides, and then we also have committee staff, so that's what I do, um, and Brandon does, we're on the Ways and Means Committee, and so we're a little more specialized when it comes to tax. The Finance Committee, where I just came from, has the same staff in the Senate. Um, but there's actually a separate committee called the Joint Committee on Taxation, and that is basically, I don't know, 60 plus both economists, probably 20, 30 economists, and tax attorneys. Typically in the tax area, and as Mr. Neal mentioned about me, my specialty area is pensions. Taxes is so complicated that generally tax attorneys specialize in one particular area. We know someone, Mr. Neal does too, um, a person who has literally spent his career working on literally one code section, the low-income uh, housing tax credit. He was on the Hill when it was enacted and then has spent a whole career because it's just so complicated advising people how to do these projects and whatnot. So we really rely, not only do we have amazing staff in terms of the Ways Means Committee and just member offices have really good staff, but we're really spread thin sometimes. We're working on um, a very complicated area and we handle the entire tax code, which can be complicated, where you have people that specialize and will, again, spend their whole career on literally one code section. So the, the attorneys at joint tax, like for example, uh, my area of pensions, there are three attorneys, over, well actually it's now two attorneys and one economist who just specialize in pensions and health benefits, that's all they do. 
Um, so it's a nice collaborative effort. So when we're giving Mr. Neal a recommendation, not only, as Brandon said, are we talking to stakeholders, and that's everywhere it went from ARP to unions to businesses to um, constituents. Um, we're also talking to experts. We're very lucky on the Hill that it's, again, not only the, the member staff, but we have the Joint Committee on Taxation. We have the Congressional Research Service, where that's a lot of attorneys and um, actuaries and economists, and they do a lot of the research behind the scenes. We have the Government Accountability Office, which is doing a lot of investigating and uh, making sure programs work the way they should. Um, so we have all of these um, outlets where we can get information, and so that when we go and give our boss a recommendation on a particular issue, we are very well informed. And, um, and I think that's key. I mean, I don't think tax policy should be done in a vacuum. And so I think it's key that you really get all different perspectives. Because you may disagree with someone, but you need to know that there's that disagreement. And you also need to tell um, your boss that that's the case, that those folks are in a little bit of a different position, even if you're taking a different view. So that's, I mean, it's a really fun job uh, for those young people in the audience who are interested in going to Capitol Hill. I've been there for quite some time at this point, and it's really, I, I, out of law school, I went to uh, work for Ernst & Young, which is a great firm, and I did that for about four or five years, um, and loved my job there, but then I went to the Hill and haven't gone back, just because it really is, you get to work on really interesting policy, work with very interesting people, and you, at your fingertips, you have these uh, resources in terms of very smart people that can help you do your job better. One of the, one of the issues that has gotten in the way of discussion of taxes in America is ideology. It's now become more and more about ideology as opposed to let's embrace what might work. And so we're up against that all of the time. And one of the difficult moments for staffers that believe in facts <laughs> is when they have to present to the member the idea that your facts don't work. <laughs> and it's a very difficult moment because we were elected on a broad-based coalition system where people have said to us, you need to do the following. We want you to do this. And then you come back and you try to score it inside of a federal revenue forecast and the numbers don't add up. And, and one issue that has really permeated the culture of America now for the better part of probably 35 years is the notion of supply side economics. It changed the way the discussion about tax policy worked. And it was embraced widely by Jack Kemp, the former congressman. And he convinced Ronald Reagan that supply side economics could be utilized not only for deep tax cuts, but it would enhance revenue by cutting taxes. And it is still part of the battle, even though you cannot find a mainstream economist in Washington that will embrace the notion of supply-side economics. I regularly torture John McCain's chief economic advisor during the presidential campaign, who was a really good guy, Douglas Holtz Aiken. I will regularly say to him in testimony secured before the committee, Mr. Aiken, is it your position that tax cuts pay for themselves? And I know what he really wants to say to me. Like, don't ask that question again. <laughs> but instead, he faithfully answers the question as a high-performing, well-regarded Republican economist. He will say, Mr. Neal, tax cuts do not pay for themselves. However, Paul Ryan worked for Jack Kemp. He believes to this day that tax cuts pay for themselves. So the argument you're about to see as we go forward in this discussion is going to be how they've changed the nomenclature of tax discussion. And they are no longer going to call it supply-side economics. They are instead calling it dynamic scoring. <laughs> so the dynamic scoring part of it goes like this. If there's a tax cut that puts more money into the hands of the public, what do they do with that money? And that is a very difficult thing to measure because people at the top save it, people in the middle 
inclined to spend a bit more of it and people at the bottom spend it immediately. Now the question is, does that generate additional economic activity? And that is based upon the deficits from the Reagan years, still part of the debate and discussion in Washington. So one of the things that the staff will try to do is they will put me out front to talk to pretty sophisticated tax journals because it's a cult. And you talk to tax experts. So this week at 8.10 on Wednesday morning, I was doing Squawk Box. <laughs> and during it, to say that Squawk Box got squawky is an understatement <laughs> during this, this interview that I had. So the fellow challenged me after I challenged the notion of supply-side economics. And I said to him a few testy things. He was highlighting the success of the Reagan growth years, to which I responded, Bill Clinton's years had higher growth with higher tax rates and four balanced budgets. But as is often the case in the modern political discussion, that was rejected out of hand by the other side. And it got to the point on uh, CNBC where he was questioning me more, and I was back at it with him on facts. And I finally said to him, are you interviewing me or are you interviewing yourself? And to say the conversation went downhill after that is appropriate. <laughs> but I, my point is that I was with, and I don't expect to necessarily remember this name, but I, in a form of bipartisanship, I really liked Bill Archer, who was a former chairman of the committee. He was from Houston, Texas, a very doctrinaire conservative Republican, but a nice man, and an old institutionalist. Doesn't like term limits, doesn't like balanced budget amendments, line item vetoes. It's about the Constitution. So I went out to this event at, uh, at uh, GW where Bill was being honored. He has an Archer Center out there where former staffers gather regularly to talk about tax policy. And I like these things. So I went out there, and myself, Charlie Rangel, Kevin Brady, and Bill Archer held forth for the evening. And I didn't know quite how it would go down in front of Bill Archer, but I challenged the theory of supply-side economics in front of an audience that might have some sympathy for supply-side economics. And I was waiting for Bill's reaction. He's 83 years old. And he said, I agree with Congressman Neal 100%. He said, I used to say to Jack Kemp, Jack, so if we cut taxes to zero, there'll be more revenue? Because <laughs> he said, that's essentially the argument. And, but that argument, you'd be surprised the foothold that it took and still has with some conservative economists. The Wall Street Journal editorial page, which I have been faithful to every day for 40 years, mm -hmm. they regularly extol the virtue, calling it different things, but of more revenue in the Treasury because of supply-side economics. And I noticed after I left yesterday, Kevin Brady went back to the Laffer curve. We debated yesterday in front of Politico with a couple of hundred commentators, and we went back and forth, and it's a pleasant conversation, but I thought I was doing pretty well, but then I had to catch a plane. And as I caught the plane, of course, the staffers are very good with the media, social media, and their the first quotes up, they've got it all in front of me, and they said, uh-oh, Kevin Brady's embraced Arthur Laffer, <laughs> and the, the Laffer curve. And I said, well, I'll be happy to have that debate with him uh, on that notion. So we're pushing hard on the inside, and I'm going to ask you to ask some questions of the staffers as well as me, because they're going to head out in about a half hour. But I'm trying to prevent tax relief for people at the top. I think they did very well during the Bush years. In 201 and 203, their top bracket was cut to 35%. And remember that many wealthy people get paid in dividends and capital gains. And the result was that it distorted the whole notion of economic equality, further concentrating money in the hands of the people at the top, who incidentally, again, don't spend it as readily. So what I'm trying to do is to say, let's build this system from the middle out. And in 201 and 203, taxes were cut by $2.3 trillion. That's a fact. And people at the top did very well. So Obama, in that famous New Year's Eve showdown we had, the rates went back to 39.6. Clinton took the rates 
to 39.6, the top rate. And it's all complicated by, and maybe they can speak specifically to these issues, because there are small businesses that need some relief, called the pass-through entities. How you structure it, however, is going to be really important. But it's a legitimate qualm that they have. And what I mean by the pass-through is they pay their taxes as part of their personal income tax obligation. So they're paying their taxes on the credit card. So they don't really derive many of the benefits that the corporate side would offer. So what I would like to do, because they're here for a half hour, encourage you uh, to ask them some questions. And one of the things that I always say when you get to drilling down with tax staff, I can guarantee you this, there will not be a question they're not going to be able to answer off the top of their heads. But softballs are appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's start by getting some questions. I will repeat the question for the benefit of everybody in the room as well as the audiovisual recording. So, um, yes. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, you said at the beginning of your uh, talk, Mr. Neal, that not everybody agreed on the problems with the current tax system. Okay. Yeah. So, so can I uh, just going to repeat the question? The, que the question is, and first of all, I will take the opportunity that Lucy took basically to thank you guys for being here. I realize that you're flying out and flying back. So, Brandon and Cara, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank that, you. Uh, we hope that you get to see a little bit of Williamstown on the way back to the car. And the <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question was, is it true that everybody, or most people, agree on what's wrong with the tax code? I would defend the position that I offered, and not necessarily based upon rates, but I do think it's overly complicated. And I do think that every time Congress submits a new tax credit, it further gums up the tax code. And I would think that there are parts of the tax code that we could be addressing that we aren't addressing at the moment. Example, expanding the earned income tax credit to single filers, expanding the child care credit. Those are things that we might be able to do. And at the same time, uh, to be candid about something else, the norm now for the OECD rates across Europe and the, what's the rest of the world is about 25%. In America, it's 35%. But after deductions, exclusions, and preferences are taken advantage of, the effective rate is closer to 16 or 17 percent. The problem is there are large parts of the economy that can't get down to 25 percent or down to 16 percent because they're either not big enough or they don't have those opportunities. Example, the software industry. It's very hard for them to become competitive with those rates. And when I look at that discussion, for any of you who itemize, how many of you itemize in the room? Do you think the tax code's too complicated? Yeah. You see, that's the point. That's the point. So I think simplification, I'm sympathetic to the idea of reducing the brackets. And I am, as I noted earlier, I am not sympathetic to the idea of people at the top uh, receiving a tax cut because I do think that they've done quite well uh, through these years. And even at 39.6, I don't think when you consider where those rates were until 86, what those rates were like, that uh, they haven't received a, or derived a benefit. Brandon? So, I mean, I would say one of the reasons why the, the tax code is so complicated is sort of twofold. Uh, one being, we do a lot of our social spending through the tax code. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons for supply side economics is sort of the, uh, to drain the money that sort of comes into the federal government. So then as a result, Democrats uh, sort of have forced to put a lot of things on that we would normally do through, you know, a block grant or something else uh, in the tax code. So because of that, that's sort of why if you look at the EITC, which, you know, is a program, you know, aimed at a uh, certain uh, income co cohort, uh, you, we would normally just either, you know, help other measures for them or whatever. So now they have to sort of go through the complicated process of getting their tax reforms and, you know, filling out tax codes and paying people to, you know, either software to do so. So that sort of is inefficient in its, in its own right. Um, and then the second thing being, you know, people look at the tax code uh, sort of for, for, for relief. And we've seen polling or, you know, sort of just uh, anecdotal polling as well about sort of what, what is facing the American family. And we know that if people were faced with a hardship of $500 or more, um, they would struggle to sort of fill that need. And if not for the EITC 
or other programs you know, that are sort of aimed uh, for these individuals, you know, they would be lost. And you know, I think one, when they look at tax reform, if sort of giving aid to these folks uh, will help them and help the economy grow, I think that's you know, sort of a worthwhile pursuit, which is why you know, Mr. Neal has sort of challenged us to sort of look at a middle out approach and how we can help individuals um, who sort of not, who have not enjoyed in the gains of the recovery. Um, you know, incomes have gone up uh, since you know, in the last four years, but they haven't gone up for all. And you know, a lot of folks are looking at uh, 10 to 12 years without a pay raise. And you can't see that. If you don't see that, that's how sort of Donald Trump and you know, Bernie Sanders have sort of come from the you know, outsider to get a large swath of the, the electorate. Um, then you're sort of missing the whole game here. And you know, I think both parties have sort of failed in their efforts to sort of talk to a lot of folks. And I think refocusing and getting back to what Democrats are core known for, um, I think that sort of be helping the tax reform debate. And, and to, to pursue the point that Brandon made, I assume here in Williamstown that you're all in favor of green energy. And then I would say to you, if we take away the tax credit for the wind production <laughs> credit, wind falls apart because it doesn't make it on its own. Now, I carry the wind production tax credit. But one of the most frustrating moments for me is the number of people who will say we love green energy, but they don't want turbines. And they don't want offshoring. But we love the wind production tax credit. <laughs> and we hate the oil states who are receiving tax benefits for drilling. So I would say to you, I bet you love electric cars, right? The critics might say, well, should the tax system include a $7,000 credit for buying an electric car? Is it a socially desirable outcome? And should the tax code be addressing, as Brandon noted, a socially desirable outcome? Or should you do as Arthur Laffer would say, just put the money in their pockets and let them decide? See, so that's what's happening. Kara, do you want to? Yeah, I guess I would just chime in to 100% uh, with what Mr. Neal and Brandon are saying. Um, but even if we do comprehensive tax reform, I mean, I think it's just the reality that we do social policy through the tax code. So I don't, we'll be able to simplify things, hopefully, if we were to do on a bipartisan basis comprehensive tax reform. But it's still going to be complicated. Tax attorneys aren't going out of business. There'll still be a need for tax attorneys because, as you noted, we're not getting rid of the charitable deduction uh, anytime soon, the mortgage interest deduction. Um, retirement savings um, in my area. I mean, one of the reasons why that area is so complicated is the 401k. We give employers a big tax break, but then we want to ensure that they provide then this benefit to both low-income people and high-income people. And that's just how the system works, and that's a, a social goal, and that makes sense. So um, I guess just to say that even if we were to do comprehensive tax reform, I do think because of these issues that they're both noting, I still think we'll probably still be a little bit complicated. More can questions? Have, before we go on, can I just follow up then? Sure. So, um, the, again, the question was, people agree on the problem. You sort of convinced me people don't agree on the problem. Because the supply siders have their ideology, and then there's a... So, the, the argument would be over what constitutes simplification. Okay. That would be part of the argument. The additional argument, to take a bit more into the weeds, is where is revenue as a percent of gross domestic product? This is really taking you into the weeds on this. So after the Bush tax cuts, when he left, after his presidency was concluded, revenue was at 15.8% of gross domestic product. Two wars, a recession, and massive tax cuts. When Clinton left as president, Revenue as a percent of gross domestic product was at 20%. Now, what does that mean? It means one was almost 16 cents on the dollar and the other was 20 cents plus on the dollar. The argument traditionally has been at about 19 cents on the dollar in terms of our, our tax exposure. So that's, that's part of the problem and how do you generate more revenue? Now, the supply siders would say during the Reagan years, revenue went up after the tax cuts. They leave out the deficits. And I would say this to you, the immediate response to that answer is the computer now builds a model that the IRS uses quite skillfully to get you to pay your taxes. 
They really are quite good at that now. And you know, for example, if you drew down a benefit on uh, a retirement plan, compliance and reporting means that the IRS is going to notify you pretty fast. You're going to get that notification now within months, or at a time when you wouldn't have got it for years about what was expected of you. But there are other questions here as well, sir? Yes. Yeah, please, Jim. Yeah. Uh, I know Representative Neal, you started this off by giving three big tax deductions, three big things. Um, do you think, one, those are the three biggest issues and or biggest uh, things to possibly change? And then, two, individually, do you support each one of those three? I do. So you started by, you say, the question was, you started by naming three really big tax expenditures or loopholes in the uh, tax code. Uh, do you agree that those are, that these are things that, do you support keeping them in the tax code? I do, but I'm going to ask Kara and Brandon to talk about the mortgage interest deduction. And the reason for that, I don't want my fingerprints on it afterwards. <laughs> uh, it is generally considered to be a middle class benefit. However, when you look at the evidence, it's a bit different. But I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about the mortgage interest deduction. How long of lease do we have? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be here for a week talking about this. Well, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of data out there on this, and I don't know if there's any realtors or home <laughs> builders in the crowd. Hopefully there aren't. Um, but the, sort of the, if you take a step back, you know, there's, there's about a trillion dollars of social spending through the tax code. Um, most of it falls on the individual side. Uh, Republicans want to do a big corporate cut. And if you sort of say getting the corporate rate down from 35% to about 20% or 25%, uh, it's about $100 billion per, per percentage point. So you're looking at a, a trillion dollar tax cut on the corporate side. Republicans will want to, and you know, those who want um, uh, tax reform will sometimes say, well, let's just take all the extenders away, or sorry, the uh, expenditures away and replace that with corporate cuts. Well, the problem with that is that a lot of itemizers, and like the congressman said, is, you know, it's one third, is that everyone sort of loves their item, you know, their, their mortgage instruction because, you know, if you're doing your turbo tax, you put in your uh, mortgage interest that you pay that year and you see that big red number go to a big green number and you're very happy because you don't want to pay more than you have to. Um, and for a lot of middle class individuals, their biggest asset at death and during their life is their home. I mean, you pour so much into it, you want to sort of see something out of it. Um, but as a renter, uh, you know, should I be subsidizing, um, you know, homes for other individuals? So there's a lot of social goods behind owning a home, you know, the neighborhoods, you know, sort of building up that part. But again, as a renter, it's like, well, should I be doing that as well? And, but I do want to own a home someday, so hopefully that the, the mortgage interest is there for me. Um, if you're looking at reform efforts around the mortgage introduction, um, a lot of people point to uh, capping the value uh, or capping um, for second homes. I, saw, I heard someone say, second homes. Um, <laughs> the problem, not the problem, but the political problem with that is, and you hear a lot from people, from senators from states who, you know, set where second homes are a big deal. I think here, uh, Michigan, uh, the coast, coastal states, the south, south southern, specifically the southern coastal states. Um, but there is some sort of, sort of a trade-off, right, where for the, the bigger part, um, for the better part during the Obama years, we had, uh, in some of the Bush years, we had a first-time homebuyer tax credit. And so if you look at sort of millennials and I am one of them. Um, we get blamed for a lot. Uh, and one of the things we're sort of mostly being blamed for now is that we're not buying homes. So the, the, rent, the, the home mortgage market is going to collapse because young people aren't buying homes. Well, the reason that we're not really buying homes is that we sort of are laden with sort of school debt and other sort, sort of, you know, that we've taken on. Um, I have you know have two degrees, so I have twice as much debt. Uh, and sort of one of the problems sort of, you know, is getting into the, the D.C. market, which is fairly crazy, uh, is that there's a barrier to entry and um, sort of maybe reforming the mortgage introduction on maybe on the second home piece to sort of help out individuals who, you know, would want to buy a home but are sort of are per precluded from buying a home because either they don't have enough equity uh, built up through savings to sort of get into the market. But um, I imagine, and I could say this with a fairly amount of certainty, that the mortgage interest isn't going anywhere because that's the first call you'll get from your constituents that you just took 20%, 20 to 30% out of the value of my home overnight. 
So I'll go even further. So I'm just speaking on my own behalf. <laughs> <laughs> Not for attribution. <laughs> exactly. Um, so another big criticism with the mortgage, it's any really deduction, the mortgage interest deduction, the exclusion for health insurance, the um, exclusion or I guess the deferral for 401k contributions, is it skewed more towards the wealthy? When you actually look at the numbers, um, we see the mortgage interest deduction as because most of us actually see ourselves as middle class people. But when you look at the data, we may actually be a higher income um, person when you look at the median income. Um, in this country. And so a lot of people, and some of our progressive members even have bills that would do this. For example, Mr. Ellison has a bill that would change the mortgage interest deduction to a credit, because a credit tends to be more valuable to a lower income person than a deduction. So um, that is also kind of some of the criticism of some of the deductions and um, exclusions. Now, I don't see that changing. These are very politically uh, popular, and lots of people are taking advantage of them. So I don't see this changing anytime soon. But it is certainly a fair criticism. And it leaves it to us, OK, if we're going to keep the mortgage interest deduction, if we're going to keep the exclusion for health insurance, what are ways that we can ensure that lower income people receive uh, benefits as well, or and you you were raising a good point too in terms of renters uh, in the case of mortgage interest deduction. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I wonder. If it's well known that in the last six or seven years, particularly in the House, uh, Internal Revenue Service has been cut by the Appropriations Committee again and again and again. They have fewer people who work in the various service centers around the around the country. Um, I recently, we were, my wife and I recently went through such experience being audited in 2013 on certain deductions. Our accountants supplied the information to the center, we obviously the return receipt requested and so on, but we just didn't hear anything from them. And of course the computer set up kept, thinks, thinks that you have not responded and the, the pressures get greater and greater and greater and finally they say, okay, now you've got to go to tax court. I wonder if it is feasible to put a 90-day limit on them replying, and if at the end of 90 days they haven't replied, then the computer automatically kicks out the, the questioning of the return and says to the tax holder, you're off the hook. Is that feasible? So one of the discussions that's sort of on a parallel track that's operating separate from uh, tax reform uh, Chairman uh, Vern Buchanan and Congressman Ranking Member Lewis are working on a, they're trying to see if they can find some space to sort of work on IRS reform to make it more um, user friendly and sort of uh, reflective of, you know, a changing population and sort of how we, people get their news, not news, but interact, with, would want to interact with the IRS. And that's one question that we sort of have been uh, angry with the Republicans about is that you sort of can't complain about, you know, lack of IRS. Uh, you know, interaction with the public if you then sort of cut their funding on a routine basis. Um, but your specific proposal, I'm pretty sure, will be in the in the mix um, and sort of continue to work with us offline to sort of get that. One advantage yeah. to it is that they can then quantify the returns they could not get to, the revenue it might have generated, yeah. and then you got to figure. Of course, right now, I don't think they have any kind of a figure as to the efficiency of the service centers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, That's point. just a suggestion. And if the IRS would just stop auditing the, the president, maybe they can get around the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people. Could you talk a little bit about the alternative minimum tax and what is if anything is likely to happen to that? Okay. This is about we, the AMT, the automatic? Yeah, uh, the AMT. Alternative we, minimum tax. Uh, Kara and Brandon and I, we have all earned doctoral dissertations in mm -hmm. the alternative minimum tax. It is one of the most complicated parts of the tax code. So about two years ago, after spending much of my Ways and Means career trying to get rid of the alternative minimum tax, I was able to convince Obama and Biden and Jack Lew, uh, who was the Secretary of the Treasury and a very well-regarded individual, that we had to do something. So in the famous New Year's agreement, we reached a, an accord where 27 million Americans no longer pay alternative minimum tax. No more. Here's the problem. The alternative minimum tax was very quickly becoming our tax system in terms of revenue. It was generating more and more income for the federal government all the time. 
So Kara and I in particular, and Brandon as well, I've been saying to her, given where we are, should we still be trying to get rid of the rest of the alternative minimum tax? She's not convinced. That's a fair <laughs> statement. And she, I, I, before I open my mouth in public, I will always check with them on numbers and say, can I still say this? Or should I not say it? So they've more or less said, we've gone as far as we should go on getting rid of AMT, because now it really only affects people at the very top. And there's one person who we know has taken advantage of the AMT in a tax filing. And you all know who he is, too. So uh, <laughs> we think that it's now skewed to people at the very top. And so they've convinced me that we're OK. Is that? No, I think that's accurate. Uh, it's very accurate. So um, we'll see what happens with respect to that in uh, the tax reform debate. But um, it did bring, it was very telling in terms of Donald Trump's tax return and that he, but for the AMT, it really worked in that instance. Um, he would have paid much less. And so that's exactly what it was supposed to do. It did what it was supposed to do in that instance. Yeah. But to answer your question, it is on the chopping block for, it's one of the sort of the, the three key things Republicans keep talking about, repealing the estate tax, repealing um, state and local tax deduction, and repealing the AMT. And on the estate tax, as Brandon mentioned it, and maybe this would be one of the questions maybe perhaps you want to ask as well. On the estate tax, uh, I've been against the, the repeal of the estate tax, and I've been uh, intransigent on the issue, largely because, as I frequently say on the floor of the House of Representatives, we serve in the House of Representatives, not in the House of Lords, <laughs> where peerage grants you specific advantages throughout the course of a lifetime based on how and who you were born to. And I think that, recall, the exclusion on the estate tax allows people right now to keep five and a half, five and a half million dollars. That's $11 million that you can keep without any taxation. I think that's fine. And I, I also, because uh, I, you always have to come up with some little way to explain it. So I, I always will say to people who want the estate tax repeal, there are 4,400 families in America now that would be exposed to the estate tax. That's it. That is it. And it does generate considerable revenue for the federal government. But if you can keep the first 11 million, you keep the first 11 million. So the way I've explained it is, it's not a tax on Conrad Hilton. It's a tax on Paris Hilton. And I think that's the way we ought to look at it. Conrad Hilton earned that money. Paris Hilton spent it. And I think that that's part of what's happened. And the other thing is I think that it defeats innovation and creativity. And I think some very wealthy families that have held on to that money, when you look at the third and fourth and fifth generation of those families, it is not pleasant to watch what is done with that money. Where Warren Buffett and Bill Gates have said, leave the estate tax the way it is, and we're giving our money away before we give it to our own children. Because they think that it will defeat that sense of ambition. Yeah. And if I could just follow up on one thing that you had said just to, and actually for the whole audience, um, when you were talking about your concern, one thing that I was really surprised about when I came to the Hill are the resources that we have in every congressional office. So if anyone's ever having a problem with the IRS or the Social Security Administration, you really should call your congressional yeah. office. They can get an answer very, very quickly and help. So I just throw that out there and to who, feel free to reach out to our office. Who is their rep? I'll leave my card afterwards. <laughs> and there's other okay. staffers there on the back, and they, uh, they bear the brunt of this. OK, yeah, read. Um, so you talk about a lot of different concerns about political feasibility. Uh, I'm sorry, you've talked about a lot of different concerns about political feasibility, about um, equity, about efficiency. So what do you see the goal of the tax system as maximizing, and how do you think about and make those various trade-offs? OK, big think question. So yeah, so what, what do you think, what kinds of things do you think the tax system should maximize? What are you shooting for? And I guess, let me turn this into another kind of question. If we flip the house and you're chairing, What's your, what's your tax package going to be? How are you going to, what are you going to maximize and how are you going to do it? Well, the one bedrock guarantee that I will not budge on is retirement savings. We've got a retirement savings problem coming in America, and a lot of employers have walked away from their traditional pension plans. And I think that when you consider that Social Security's average benefit, average benefit is $14,800 a year. People are not getting rich on the Social Security benefit. However, savings and a 
retirement plan, which for young people in the audience, you are never going to know about the idea of a defined benefit. That's gone. And it started well before I went to Congress, that erosion of support for the defined benefit. So you're going to be in a position of the defined contribution. And there's an element of risk in the defined contribution because that stock market really does have to go up annually for your retirement benefits to grow. And more and more of what you're doing with your retirement benefits are going to be part of that. So that's one thing. And the second thing is no cuts to Social Security. Now, I know people will say to me, well, Congressman, actuarial reality dictates something else. The Social Security Trust Fund pays full benefits until 2034. Full benefits. And we have fixed it many times in the past, including with Reagan and O'Neill. We fixed it, and we will fix it again. So I think that between Social Security and the tax incentives for retirement savings, those are very, very important considerations. And because you raise a very good question, here's another thing for you to look through in this tax debate. It is what is known as state and local tax deductions. And how do some states, particularly high-income states, treat that? So when you hear Republicans say, we're getting rid of that deduction because it's a blue state benefit, wait till they start to hear from some of those homeowners in Charleston, South Carolina. Wait till they start to hear in Palo Alto, California, and places like that from members of their own party. So I think that those are the kinds of things you want to pay attention to. But for me, simplicity, retirement savings, I, I, I've spent a career working on it, and I'm sticking with it. So do you guys want to address the big think, the question of what do you think the tax code should, should maximize? Well, I, I sort of think, for? yeah, I mean, and also the, the second question about what is his first um, sort of year looks like. I mean, I would say jobs is the first sort of key on the second part, and then we'll get to the first one. Um, you sort of see a jobs mismatch in the economy right now where, you know, the congressman will correct me on the number of uh, vacant jobs in New England right now for skilled manufacturing. 18,000. Um, and so, you know, our economy isn't built right now for the future where, um, you know, you have this sort of high skilled where you, you, know, you may or may not need a, a college degree for to go into a manufacturing job, which 30, 40, 60 years ago, you didn't, you, you could graduate with a high school uh, diploma. So one of the things that we were sort of having, and someone who's recently graduated from, um, well, not recently, I guess within the last 10 years, graduated from college, is that, you know, you have debt issues for uh, college students now. Um, you know, you sort of see all that through, through, from the campaign, the presidential campaign, where, you know, ideas around that. And I think sort of addressing these, this crisis, that this sort of looming crisis of how do you get the workforce of today, um, you know, how do you incentivize that through the tax code or through federal government spending? And so that's sort of the, the first question is to make sure that we have enough spending or enough revenue coming into the federal government to sort of do the social aims, which is where we sort of want to have the biggest bang for our buck. Um, whether or not robots take all of our jobs mm -hmm. is a sort of thing that keeps us up at night. Uh, well, not me, but you know, the economy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I like to see a robot become a correctional staffer. That'd be funny. Um, <laughs> but that's sort of one thing that we sort of you know, are, are just focus on in, in, the, in the economy is just what is happening to the American worker and how we sort of can prepare them for both the future um, as well. And that's why the congressman has various proposals around uh, you know, apprenticeship programs, trying to bring those back to sort of get people along, and then also sort of making sure and ensuring that community college is accessible for folks because, you know, as someone from Chicago, we used to have a lot of these vocational Votech jobs or schools for, the, for Votech jobs and now those are sort of being um, gobbled up by for-profit co colleges and sort of to, to take a job for HVAC or whatever and have to pay $20,000 a year for that is just ludicrous and something that shouldn't happen. So that's at least my, my perspective. And I, well, the first thing that came to mind when you asked this question was similar to Mr. Neal is savings. Um, I do think that's so important. And as Mr. Neal mentioned, this shift from, from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans, that does keep, keep me up at night. I'm afraid that it's really hard. I mean, when you're working, you're, you know, you have to pay for childcare, saving for your kids to go to college, to pay the rent. Uh, get food on the table, it's hard to save, and so much of it's on the individual these days. I do get very nervous for that next generation when they retire that we'll have enough money 
and also if we'll understand how to uh, manage those assets in retirement because it's now just not a check coming in the mail once a month it's us figuring out how much that two hundred thousand dollars would last last you know for 20 years potentially and that's a long time as we're living longer so i would say savings um number one and then number two i guess to what both of the uh these gentlemen were saying it's, it's, and kind of what I alluded to as well, it's middle class first. It's helping um, everyday Americans, again, pay for childcare, get uh, food on the table, um, uh, allow their kids to go to whatever school they want them to go to, things like that. And so that is certainly, and I, that's why I think it's great that Mr. Neal really focus on in terms of uh, tax reform, uh, the middle class first, because I think that's so vitally important. Okay, another question? Right, we're right here. Yeah, Jeff, you so um, I read in the newspapers that the uh, Republican plans for tax reform are, are not well formed. Um, we certainly don't know what they are, but you guys are insiders, so can you tell us what you think actually happened? Will we simply get the same uh, tax system with lower rates, or will some of these uh, deductions be on the topic? So what's, the question is, what is the inside story about what the Republicans really want to do? My, I think that we're going to miss an awful good opportunity if we call tax reform a tax cut. And I think that in the end, if they have kind of the paltry success that they've had this year, and that's not a, that's not a partisan statement. They just haven't been able to do anything, and they, they can't agree on anything which I've encouraged, uh, <laughs> but, but while they can't agree on anything, they can't agree on what the tax system ought to look like because you have 40 members of the Freedom Caucus, which are impossible, just impossible. And they're going to say that if you cut taxes, what's it going to do to deficits? And when the president says no tax cuts for people at the top, that's contrary to supply side economics. So I think that on the inside, you're liable to get some marginal tax cuts, and they're called tax reform. And, and they talk to the Republican staffers every day, so they might be able to glean some additional information. I would say one of our uh, roles, I think, in the minority is making sure the facts are out there. And so you're right, the president always is now on this kick about this is, should only be about the middle class and no tax cuts for the wealthy. But I was sending around to our team this little chart the other day. Every single Republican plan that has come out, including a couple of the president's plan, have just, that's just not true, you know, that has not been the case. Huge tax cuts for the wealthy, very skewed towards the wealthy, and very small um, tax cuts for middle class. In fact, um, the House Republicans' blueprint plan would see for single parents, single parents would see a tax increase. 20 million Americans would see a tax increase. So I think it's really our job is to share, just, it's, this is not being partisan at all. These are just the facts. And um, having folks that are nonpartisan, like the Joint Committee on Taxation and some of these outside uh, think, think tanks that can do some analysis and get these facts out there and, and will we'll help as well. So okay. Kara deals in facts, I deal in sort of <laughs> disruption. Um, I would say, you know, if you're hope, holding out hope for a, a grand Republican tax reform plan, you're going to be waiting for a really long time. Um, I think, you know, inside internally, we say you know, it would be a compliment to call it a, you know, a circling firing squad because then, you know, they can't, they're agreeing to be in the same room with each other. Um, but I, I think that, you know, some of the things that the Congressman highlighted is that they're reeling from the healthcare debate, whether, you know, they say it publicly or not. Um, the recent debt limit deal that was sort of announced, um, it was this weird world where uh, Lou Dobbs was defending Pelosi and <laughs> Schumer and calling Ryan uh, a rhino. It was the, mo I mean, look it up. It's, it was the most surreal thing I've ever seen. And you can just know that mm -hmm. this, this is this bizarre world where if Donald Trump does it, right, and he sort of, you know, thumbs his nose up at the Republican establishment, you will see the Fox talking heads parrot back verbatim. Um, I thought I saw something where if you voted for Trump in the primary and you voted for him in the general, 98% of his followers are still with him. And I, the, the TV shows, I mean, the Fox sees this, so they know Trump is the leader of the Republican Party, 
not McConnell, not Ryan, and anytime Trump can, he, I mean, he's, he's you know, he's a, a truly a wild card. And I think, you know, someone like Mitch McConnell, who is sort of used to being buttoned down and buttoned up, and with Ryan, who's sort of um, their, you know, think tank guy, you know, to see Trump is sort of, is upsetting. And he's sort of upsetting them at every, um, you know, he can't stay off Twitter, you know, he won't stay, stay off Twitter, and he's, and he's not focused, right? I mean, you know, one week he's talking about, you know, tapes or other not tapes or whatever. And so it's hard, yeah. you know, it was hard when Obama, you know, was doing ACA, sort of as a, you know, let's hold this, hold, hold this up as like a legislative achievement. It took 17 months and Obama doing thousands of hours of speeches and if you look at the 86 Act, you know, there's reels and reels and reels of paper on what they're trying to do. Thus far this year, they put out two combined pages on what they're going to do, and there's scant detail. And as tax reform, you know, the Congressman is always fond of saying, you can get everybody to agree on, you know, general, um, generalities, but you can, it's, specifics is where the deal is cut, and specifics are where the deal dies. And I think it, Republicans are having a hard problem with what they want the tax code to look like and what, it, what they want it to do. And it's going to be hard to sort of nail down specifics because you're sort of at the at, at bare bones. And if you're a Republican from, you know, sort of uh, a swing district or a moderate seat, you've already taken a, a one hard vote on health care. You don't want to take another hard vote on taking away a lot of exclusions, preferences, and deductions because that means one thing for you, forced retirement. Just one other point, and i give you a, kind of an economic uh, analysis. One of the real problems that America faces right now is the worker participation rate. It's a real serious issue, and it's part of the aftermath of the recession. And for the younger folks that are here, what that really means simply is that in the aftermath of uh, the post-war period, generally about 66 percent of the American people have had employment. Well, that number really slumped in the, in the midst of the recession. And it's estimated still that there are eight to nine million people who have left the workforce and we don't know where they are. Now, some of them went to Social Security disability benefits. A lot of people took the Social Security benefit at 62. Not understanding that if you postpone it until 69, it's a 7% increase annually. And that worker participation rate essentially plays out with the following. We have now examined almost 12 years of about 1.8% annual economic growth. And what does that mean? It means about 200,000 jobs a month. Now, I just would contrast that with the Clinton years, the last four, 23 million jobs and four balanced budgets. Now, why is that important? Because 23 million people were paying more federal taxes. So the Treasury was loaded. But at the same time, because social spending in America is largely formulaic, social spending went through the floor with an unemployment rate of 3.8%. So Brandon mentioned, and I highlight this all the time, there are 18,000 precision manufacturing jobs right now in New England that go unanswered. Shame on all of us. And there's a greater hostility to growth in America in many quarters. People, the Boston Globe highlights today some of the challenges here in the Berkshires. And part of it is there's less interest in growth. And I think that if you have, again, if we had two years of 3% growth, it would change the complexion of the argument that we're having. I think there's a couple more questions, and I know they have to get going. But Go ahead, Harry. Oh, thanks. Um, there are hundreds of billions of dollars of uh, profits being held by American corporations and pro and uh, that is one of the topics that comes up. Is there a good way to repatriate it? And uh, I noticed the economist in a small article last week said, uh, be careful, don't, don't blow it. And, uh, but I think there have been some suggestions of trying to tie that with uh, uh, infrastructure spending, which is something that oh, the Trump has neither come up with nor would he have any plan to fund? But is there a, uh, a viable, profitable way to, to get those profits repatriated? Good question. The repatriation of profits. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's $2.8 trillion sitting offshore. Now, that doesn't mean it's in a bank. 
because you're not going to bring back the cars and the buildings and the elevators and things like that. But there is an awful lot of cash sitting offshore. And it's, some would argue it sits there. It really doesn't. It's in banks and many corporations use it anyway. But trying to bring that back should be a goal for all of us. But it also ties into the argument that's even more critical, and that's called stateless income, and where profits are booked across the globe. And I think getting that money back is really important, but the argument's going to be over what's the rate to bring it back. And in 2004, I think, or 2005, over my objections, the Ways and Means Committee voted to bring back that money at the time and what would be described as a tax holiday at 5.25 percent. And it was advertised as a job creator. It didn't create any jobs. It was passed on, and this, this is a decision management makes. It was passed on under the guise of good management to the shareholders and stock buybacks. That's really what happened with the money. So I am on a, you want to know an inside? Yes. All right. I'm afraid if you bring that money back with another tax holiday, you'll never get tax reform. So I'm pushing to hold that out until the very end as a strategy. Don't let them bring that money back until we have a strategy to force tax reform. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, so um, tying together with what Mr. Casey said about the effect of technology on, on job creation and what you were saying about um, the jobs that, you know, various things on job creation. In, in your examination of tax reform, are you thinking about a future that may include a, a guaranteed minimum income? Mm. So what are you thinking about a future of guaranteed minimum income? I rely a lot upon the Center for Policy and Priorities, Bob Greenstein. He's really good. And uh, they really do deep-seated work. They're terrific. He's really liberal. And he's dead set against it. He thinks the value of getting up and going to work every day and having social interactions is really important. And I do think, as I described the worker participation rate in America, it's something we need to be mindful of. So I'm not there yet. Bob Reich, who I, I know uh, did a panel with about a year ago, he thinks we need to examine it because one of the best job creators and income generators in America, for people who have not done a lot of formal education, is to be a truck driver. And in about a decade and a half or so, there's going to be fewer truck drivers. So we're going to have to think about what this new technology means. I I'm suspect. I, I think there is some self-regard that comes with getting up and going to work every day. So uh, I think we, at this point, we have to let Brandon and Kara go, right? You well, I just want to, on my own. I just yeah. want to drill down on that one point yeah. about truck drivers is that if you sort of, everyone has sort of talked about the disaffected white male voter that sort of went to Trump. Uh, truck driver is the number one job for the group that's 25 to 44. Um, so sort of a, a future with, a, or driver of some sort, not whether mm -hmm. it's a truck or not. But. And one other thing, um, so as an alternative, a lot of people have talked about, including the CBBP, is expanding, and Mr. Neal actually has legislation that would go part of the way, is expanding the earned income tax credit. So that's tied to work, and so making that more generous, because then you'd have the work connection, but then you'd have, be able to kind of supplement the wages. But as, a, as, a, as the title said, tax reform is hard, and you can see why. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. So okay. do you want one more question, or, are you, or do you have to get going? We Liz, can take a Liz, you decide now. Okay, so uh, Professor Bakia, you had your hand up earlier. So. Oh, yeah. So, so my question is, I know you guys are in the House, and this is the Senate rule, but how confident are you that the Byrd rule will actually prevent the Republicans from passing a permanent tax cut with less than 60 votes? that seems like the only thing that gives them an incentive to strike a deal with you. So are they acting in the House like they need to strike a deal with you to get a permanent tax cut? Or are they acting like they can gain the bird rule and then just get the permanent tax cut on earth? So no, we're going to have yet. to explain the bird, no, bird yes. rule. So go ahead. <laughs> um, the bird rule, uh, named after uh, former Majority Leader uh, Robert Byrd from West Virginia, is that you can't have, if any sort of big policy change, you can't have deficits in the out years. So the way that the 01, 03 tax cuts got around the bird rule was that they just made everything sunset in year 10, uh, which is why you had in 2010 a year where we didn't have the estate tax. 
and that's why they call George Steinbrenner the smartest man in, in the world, because he, even in death, he still beat the system. Um, He's a graduate of here, I think. Yeah. Oh, is he really? <laughs> Shout out to Steinbrenner, Steiny. Nice <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's sort of why, and sort of the thought being, um, Republicans will sort of probably try to game the system and do sort of a similar situation um, uh, where they just have everything phase out in, in year nine or year 10 and have a future Congress deal with it, which is sort of typically how things have, have gone. Okay. I think there's a, this lady's had her hand. Yes. She's been waiting. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, anybody ever talks about the, uh, the Simpson Bowles recommendation. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that that was truly bipartisan very good people spent a lot of time coming up with suggestions where every constituency uh, took some responsibility for true tax reform, but uh, you don't know, hear about it anymore. So this is a question about the Simpson-Bowles Commission, the so-called Deficit Commission. So there have been a, a, that's a great um, question, and there's Simpson Bowles, and there have been a number of proposals out there that are these really comprehensive packages. The problem is there are winners and losers in tax reform, and Simpson Bowles are winners and losers. Um, chairman Camp, who was a former chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, had a package, winners and losers. And so unfortunately, these package, because of the losers, uh, I think Mr. Neal says uh, frequently, you, you, um, hear, you don't hear from the winners, but you hear very loudly from the losers. <laughs> And it just makes it hard politically. And that's why it's really difficult for the Republicans. They've decided strategically to go on their own with this. But, and I know for many Republicans, it's in their DNA to cut taxes. But comprehensive tax reform is about tax cuts and tax increases. And that can be very challenging. And so thus something like Simpson Bowles included both. I think if we would really, if the Republicans instead had decided to work with us um, together on a bipartisan basis, so in many ways the members are jumping off the cliff together, that would have been a smarter way to get these things done. I just, it's going to be really difficult to do comprehensive tax reform as one party. So two observations. Um, one, we sort of derisively say Republicans only care about deficits when Democrats are in the White House. Um, and then the second thing being, there are no tax ideas that ever die. And um, if it's introduced somewhere, someone will remember it later when they need money. <laughs> so a lot of the staffers who worked on Simpson Bowles still are on the Hill. One is sort of the chief tax counsel on the Senate finance side was sort of the staff director of the Simpson Bowles Commission. I imagine when the Senate is looking for to scratch for revenue, they will look back to Simpson Bowles, not the full package, but cherry pick some pieces. So all of it may not be there. Sort of the big deal is sort of dead as, as it is now, um, but I imagine not all of it, but some of it will probably live through in some, the Senate version of the, of the tax bill. Just because we know how to cut taxes, we don't, it's harder to raise taxes like Carol said. So when you find the good revenue raisers that sort of have mm -hmm. been, um, have survived the public thrashing, they tend to stay around. Okay, so I think we're gonna allow you guys to go catch your plane. Thank you. We wanna thank, thank you so again much. for coming up here. Now this, this doesn't mean that your, that your questions at this point have to become less wonky. Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, just a word on the, the two that are leaving. You just had a demonstration of what it's really like with tax staff. I mean, they get the last word with me all the time, and we should be thankful for it. So more questions? Mr. Harrison. Wait. Uh, you talk about supply side ideology. How are, how are the, your friends across the aisle uh, explaining away what happened in Kansas? It seems to be an absolute laboratory, a real experiment, a lot of experiment. So, how do, yeah, have you heard Republicans address what happened with that experiment in Kansas with Sam Brownback? The governor got an ambassadorship. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call the exit ramp. Uh, I think that uh, in, in Kansas, even his own party turned on him because he embraced supply-side economics. And I'm not, I'm not going to personally uh, denigrate him. I knew him. I served with him in the House for a long time. I wish both parties would get off of the rigid ideology that now permeates every discussion and get back to a factual discussion. 
You heard me argue a, a bit ago about what 2% growth does not do for America. We need to get, for these young people that are here, we need to get that number up to three, three and a half, four percent growth annually. And some of our positions, I think, spend too much time with grievance as opposed to aspiration. So if you deal now with the base of the Democratic Party, the conversations can be pretty hard. And for example, if you don't think Nancy Pelosi is liberal enough, but this is what's happened. And on the Republican side, Mitch McConnell is not conservative enough. So what it does, it pulls them, you know, away from what might be what we was once described as the essential center of American politics. I mean, it, we're a long way from the Eisenhower and Kennedy years, I can tell you that, uh, in terms of the two parties getting together. I mean, many of the great things that happen, they have to happen with two parties. A lot of Republicans voted for Social Security. A lot of Republicans voted for Medicare. A lot of Republicans voted for the, Social, for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And on our side, a lot of Democrats from time to time have cast some very difficult votes on welfare reform. And so the, but, but that's now, you know, you do that, and you've committed treason. And, and I think that trying to get that conversation back to some modicum of problem solving is very, very important. And it's the, part of it's the social media effect, too, because it never really goes away. And I think members are more reluctant to be candid about some of the things that they really feel. And so I think that in the case of uh, Sam Brownback, I would be very critical of what he embraced because uh, education was put on the back burner and revenue did not go up. Exactly. That's the issue. So we had a, so, please. Uh, in the first two years of his term, uh, Ronald Reagan lowered the tax rate from 70% to 50%. By the end of the third year, unemployment had jumped by 2.4 percent, full percentage points. Now, when Clinton raised his taxes, the reverse happened. Unemployment went down. Now, it seems that the rich are investing in financial instruments, taking the money out of the economy when they get a tax break, and that uh, when you raise taxes on them, they scramble to find ways to deduction and creating small businesses and hire employees, the most lucrative of those. Mm -hmm. Now, how can we convince people that that's pattern as well? I looked at the, the correlation for, from Reagan up until a few years ago, and it seemed to be much more often than not that it followed that pattern. There's a reverse relationship between unemployment and taxes. Well, having been one who voted for all three of those budgets, and certainly felt some of the sting. Let me also give credit to George Bush Sr. Because his budget helped set the trajectory in the right direction. Recall that he had said during the campaign against President Reagan when they ran uh, all the way through the Iowa caucus, he called it voodoo economics. And then he had to succumb to what had happened in terms of the supply side argument and he looked at what was happening in 1991 and 92 to federal revenue. And that's when he reversed course, and I voted for that budget. And then Bill Clinton, having had the courage, without one Republican vote, by the way, twice. Not one. When I hear these folks say we cooperated during the Clinton years, that's not true. They didn't. They didn't give us one vote for those two budgets. And the economy took off because Bob Rubin and Alan Greenspan, they said, if we can move in the direction of balanced budgets, which we did, and let's be candid, when you were a Democrat, the first thing you do when you go into the room is not to argue about how much we can balance the budget. We tend to believe in long-term investments, that it pays a handsome dividend down the road if you invest now, and if that means a bit of borrowing, there's a bit of borrowing. So here comes Clinton, and federal revenue, as I said earlier, just goes through the roof because of the, the budget forecast. And some periods, some quarters of growth of four or five percent. And I think that the other part of it, I think that would be very difficult, though, that I used to piggyback on what I said earlier. Ronald Reagan could not get nominated by the Republican Party today, and Bill Clinton could not get nominated by the Democratic Party today. That's the reality of what's happened. And, and Bill Clinton's a good friend of mine, and I just thought that the mainstream arguments that we made those years were really important to the country. And uh, to your point, 
you're absolutely on target. But there's another thing that uh, my Republican friends always leave out about the argument about Ronald Reagan, and I do acknowledge his optimism. But there's a part of it that they leave out. You never hear it. He supported tax increases 11 times while he was president. 11 times. And to your point about those two tax cuts, that's why it helped bring about tax reform. Because he looked at it by the time he got to 86 and said, we've got to do something about revenue. They never bring that into the argument. They never include it. It's, it's always just the gipper. He cut taxes and all of that. And, and on our side, I, I think that our party is, uh, we used to be the party of pro-growth economics. And on Labor Day of this year, let me give you a statistic that I think ought to be very compelling for all of us. On this Labor Day, 6.5% of the private sector in America is organized. Oh, no, you're absolutely right, but that's statistical data. Yeah. That's, those are facts. And, uh, th but the other point I just want to follow up on, one of the things that's happened to us in the Midwest, if somebody had said to you in this room 20 years ago that Michigan would be a right-to-work state or that Wisconsin would be a right-to-work state, you would have said that's impossible. And what's happened is 13% of the labor force in America is now organized. That's it. And during the New Deal, during the Roosevelt years, one out of three households in America had a union member. More than 30% of the America was organized. And what we discovered in Michigan and Wisconsin was that the private sector unions didn't want to pay for public sector union benefits anymore. So when the referendum questions came up, they cast votes against some of those benefits. So that, that's part of the, the challenge we have. Jim? Okay. Professor Wright. Please. Hi, I'm a political scientist. I want to thank you for doing this educational event and also for what I'm going to do. Um, both the informed and progressive positions on taxes. And for citizens, it's such a rare opportunity to talk to you that I want to ask about something else and something where I'm a little more perplexed by your position. And specifically, by your sponsorship of H.R. 1697, the Israeli anti-boycott bill. So we know where I'm coming from. I'm involved in democratic, not only not, I'm involved in democratic politics. Um, I'm not in favor of BDS. I don't support academic boycotts. I do favor boycotting enterprises in the West Bank, but as partly descended from people who fled Hitler, I think I understand the seriousness of anti-Semitism. But I find it a little appalling. Unlike, I suspect, some sponsor that read it. By who? Uh, so I, I read the bill. I read the ACLU analysis. I read the debunkings of the ACLU analysis. I have to confess, reading the bill, there's too much wonky technical stuff. I'm confident, I, I can't say for sure whether, as the OCLU claims, it criminalizes individual dissent on this issue, but it does seem to me that what this bill does ranges from something like that to, on the other end, the best debunking of that, I read, said, really, it's a nothing burger of a bill. It doesn't do anything. It just gives a PR victory to any back. So my question to you is, why would a congressman in the safest of safe seats in a liberal state be a co-sponsor of the bill? Fair enough. Oh, fair enough. Good so question. The uh, question is about uh, House 1697, Senate 720, which is a, a bill that uh, is alleged to criminalize uh, dissent uh, by, by criminalizing or by putting st harsher penalties for people who boycott or call for boycotts of Israel because of its activities in the West Bank. Yeah. And uh, Congressman Neal is a co-sponsor of the bill along with uh, 200 some others. Yeah, with 270 members of the House. Uh, fair question. So just by way of DNA, in the mid-1980s, as mayor of Springfield, I sold the city stocks in South Africa. Sold the city stocks in South Africa. And this is an argument about commerce. It is not an argument about free speech, because there's no threat to free speech. If you want to be hostile to Israel, you can be hostile to Israel. If you want to say anything you want about Israel, if you want to participate in a boycott yourself about Israel, that's fine. This is about commercial activity. I dispute that part on the free speech side of it. And to, I'm glad you read the bill because one of the things I did in preparation for today, I went back and read the CRS analysis of it, which I have in the car. And if we could maybe get it to you. Because I do understand the point that's being made. And, but to clarify it, to perhaps subtract from some of the suspicion that's been created because of it, 
We've talked to Ben Cardin, who was the original author from Maryland about the issue, and he's agreed to go back and clarify that language so that there would not be any threat or there wouldn't be anything that would be confused as a threat to free speech. And I think in this instance here, there are genuine disagreements on it. I have been a supporter of Israel, and I say that not because of AIPAC, but because of the fact that it has been in the Middle East not only a functioning democracy, but supports the institutions of democracy, including free speech, the right to assemble. Anybody who's been to the Knesset, you know it's an engaging conversation. And also, free press. And I think some of the hostility to Israel comes from those that don't practice any of those undertakings. And I think that as I look at this, I would not be a Netanyahu voter. I would have been a Shimon Perez voter <laughs> looking for the two-state solution. But I think that zeroing in on this on the free speech side, which I understand because it's created some anxiety, fair enough. I see no threat, and when I read the CRS report on it, it furthers my position that I see no threat. But I did think that so that some suspicion might be alleviated, we're going to go back and get clarification. Yeah, and I'm glad you're a political science professor because I'm one too. And I, I do, I've been pretty assertive over my many, many years in public life about opinion that disagrees with me. Thank you. Yeah. There was another hand, I think. Yes. I favor that. I think that's the most immediate way to replenish the Social Security Trust it's Fund. It's a cap on the Social Security, yeah. that is the income that is taxed? Yeah. And the better way, by the way, to do that is to get more people working. And, by the way, let me, here's a fascinating story about, I'm a supporter, of course, of immigration. And uh, I, I, could, I just, this is a very important consideration. This is, might surprise some of you here. Because of undocumented immigration, the Social Security Trust Fund derives a benefit of about $8.5 billion a year. Because people work with phony Social Security numbers, but they're never going to get the benefit. So they contribute to the trust fund, but they'll never get the benefit. And I think part of the way that we replenish the workforce is immigration. And we have in America, and by the way, here in Berkshire County, a pronounced problem now with demographic trends. You need to keep replenishing those people that go to work so that they can pay the Social Security benefits from those of us who might expect to use them someday. Just to supplement on that, uh, Social Security is only on wages. Majority of non-wage income comes in at the higher level. Dividends and cap gains. Huh? Dividends and cap gains. Right. Yeah. And why, why not put those in? Well, you know, in, in the Reagan years, that's another argument that's left out. They were treated equally in the code. <laughs> cap gains rates as well as the dividend rates were treated with ordinary with ordinary income rates. Okay, yeah. so I, one more question here. I see your hand in the back. That's all right, so two more questions and then we're done. So okay. okay. Um, Tax reductions at the, at the top um, are more of a drain on the economy than they are a, a stimulant. Um, does it also have an effect on the stability of the economy in that uh, you have a ton of rich people with a lot more money than they know what to do with, they're going to build bubbles kind of by, by kind of perforce and destabilize the economy again and again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you're right on target. And, and I, let me say this, I, there are provisions in the code, for those of you who follow the wonkiness of what you just heard, there are provisions in the code where I think that one could argue in an economic downturn that, for example, accelerated depreciation allowance makes some sense. You encourage people to do things they might not ordinarily do to get some money into the marketplace. And at the same time, one of the things that they're trying to do now is to make that permanent immediate expensing. The problem with that is it takes away another tool you have in an economic downturn. And, and I do think the concentration of wealth that you've described accurately also goes like this, because I think it's an important consideration. If we were sitting in this room 50 years ago, the smartest kids in America went off to make something. The smartest kids in America today are drawn to finance, because the results are more immediate. 
And if you're coming out of college with huge bills, you're going to look for the immediate. And I think when you look at the manufacturing jobs that were such an important part of the New England economy, we also came to understand that you can do today production anywhere. What we can't do anywhere is innovation. We do that better than anybody still. So I think rewards in the tax system for innovation and creativity, R&D credits, things of that nature, that's where we should be, be spending our investments. Yeah. One last question. Uh, I think going to tie into something you just said. Um, we all know about student loans and the issues of the students not being able to you know, have these students loan debt. But as, as a parent trying to save money for my child who doesn't have student loans, there's not really anything in the tax code that would be like an IRA, which would really, really help you know, incentivize people or myself to save. So all we're getting is like the, the free uh, taxes on the interest made well, I have some sympathy for your argument, having put four through school, parochial schools, and then four through uh, two through prep school, and two through uh, four through college. The last one had a good jump shot, so he played <laughs> D1 basketball. <laughs> I'm glad I encouraged that during the years. But uh, it's a chicken and egg argument as well. So I borrowed against my 401k three times, which means. You work a bit longer, but we're going to live a bit longer, so that's baseball. And then the second thing is I remortgaged the house three times. And then took a second job teaching. Because I do think that there's another part of that, as you've explained it, and that is that the evidence is pretty compelling. The smartest kids are going to do really well. And the problem we have today, it's endemic, is that people at the bottom end, they're really locked in. Because the jobs at one, at one time that would have absorbed them into the economy are no longer existent. I mean, you could have quit high school in the 40s and gone to work for a big manufacturer, and you were going to have a job because of your union, likely for the rest of your life, with a solid wage. And if you were willing to do a little bit of overtime on Saturdays and Sundays, you were going to do really well. And I mean, I, I call attention to, I use Springfield as an example, because the East Coal Hand Tool Company was in Springfield. Why was that important? Because they made the Sears ratchet. And when I first began to campaign for office, there were three shifts at that East Coast plant. And I sat with the union, uh, uh, stood with the union boss, as you would be called, the agent, outside that factory for three shifts and shook hands with everybody that went in because you had the sponsorship of the union president where you shook hands. And, and just another small anecdote, everybody you shook hands with only had two fingers or so because they had been cut off from those machines. And I, I, I bring that up because those jobs don't exist anymore. So what kind of jobs do exist? It's the innovation economy. And it's to the point of taxation, what are we going to do about the digital economy? And the consumer now walks into a retailer, takes a picture of the product, and goes to buy it online so they can avoid taxes on it. It's a revenue issue. So I think that we could have an easier discussion about a lot of these things if revenue forecasts were where they ought to be instead of cutting taxes in a time when uh, we're still fighting two wars, and we have a million new veterans. So I'm talking more about parents trying to save the kids yeah. and not having a tax. So yeah. Just do that. Yeah, I, I, I propose that. I have legislation that I've put out there, I think, three or four times. I think that where you can convince people for debt forgiveness, but I, one of the things you're never supposed to do is you're never supposed to ask a question of somebody who you don't know the answer to in politics. But since the president's here, how many of the members of the student body here receive financial aid? Half. Half. And as I said, I was on the board of Mount Holyoke for 10 years. That's about the number. They're not paying the full bill. And I, I think that that's the challenge that we face. Do you want to take a stab at that, Mr. President? Well, about, uh, so the, as a question about the, the tax, the tax. Yeah. But he, he would like tax relief for sending treatment. a child to college. Fair enough. I mean, I, I mean, our, you know, you know, Williams, it, we're in this fortunate position where we meet the full need of every, of every student. And so the way that would work for a Williams family would be that you know, the amount that they could pay to save, the amount that they could afford to pay would wind up being larger. And so we would wind up, that winds up getting down south in financial aid than somebody can. But we're very atypical, right? So if you talk about a typical institution is not meeting the full need of, of all their They're not able to do that you know, in, in an equal way. And there, that would be, a, you know, I think, a very significant and important subsidy for middle class families to send their kids. Now that's an investment of 
the government in that. That's the decision you have to make, how that relates to other investments in education that the government will want to make. And I, that's something for the congressman to decide. But I think that would play out differently at different sorts of institutions. And that's the point I would make. I'm going to say something that's got nothing to do with William since I had the floor, which is that I think the key issue in affordability of higher education is not the, the kind of individual tax benefits that may accrue to families, but the defunding of the public institutions that we depend on. I'm a graduate of the University of North Carolina. You know, that was a 17 campus system in North Carolina that has, over, that has seen a generation of slow death by a thousand cuts. And the affordability of those public institutions that, that educate 10, 100 times the number of kids that we do here at Williams. That's really where the access to higher education for the, for the modal person in this country comes from. And that has been decimated. So I would personally, if I were in public policy, which I unfortunately do not have to make the hard decisions the congressman has to make, if I were to take a dollar and say I want to support higher education, I'd put that dollar into the public institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to, just to follow up on it, it, UMass, which is now a star of the, the education systems across America, one of the things that's interesting about UMass right now is that where it genuinely at one time was a state-supported school, that is no longer necessarily the case. And the state contribution to it is now almost reduced annually. Okay, so we have to wrap up, but uh, I encourage you to stick around a little bit in case you wanted, especially students, uh, in case you want to uh, hang out a little bit with Congressman Neal. And then he's, but he's going to have to leave here in about uh, 10 minutes or...